All right, I'm here at me nan's house. I'm having to use her computer because my computer, well, it was accidentally destroyed. <laughs> like I said, a complete accident. Well, anyway, I'm using me nan's computer to shop for a new computer. I wonder what I'll get. Oh, what's this one? An Altair 8800. Oh, let's have a look. How much? Four grand? Paying four grand for a box with some blinky lights on it. Oh, well, I suppose if I need a new computer, I haven't really got a choice, have I? I have to cash in some of my government bonds. I mean, they must be worth a bundle now. The government know what they're doing with money, don't they? Um, did he just put a debit card on the barcode reader? Oh, Rishi, no. All right, me government bonds are worthless. Um, you got any money, human man? No? All right. Well, now that we've established that me and the human man can't actually afford four grand for a blue box with a few LEDs in it, suppose, um, well, we have to make our own, won't we? Shouldn't be too hard. We're both smart people. Well, we're both people. Um, we're both alive. If you build along with us, you could have this by the end of the video. I mean, obviously, you could make yours probably better than ours. Ours is a bit of a mess, really, isn't it? Maybe don't look too hard. I'll do the voiceover, and the human man will do the building. The parts we'll be using in this video are two breadboards, one Z80, one 74HC14, one 22 microfarad capacitor, 17 LEDs, 26 1 kilo ohm resistors, a 68 kilo ohm resistor, and a 220 ohm resistor. Oh yeah, and some wire. Let's start by making this blinky LED. This will be the clock for our computer. To make the clock for our computer, we'll be using this circuit here. It's a very simple circuit and only uses three components, a Schmidt trigger inverter, a resistor, and a capacitor. To make the clock, we'll be using this chip here, a 74HC14. It's a 14 pin chip, which contains six separate inverters. Dud, 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 dud. We'll go into the details of how the circuit works, but it's more fun to build it and then figure out how it works afterwards. So let's do that. The human man will now build the circuit. Start by connecting up the power and ground. Now get our 74HC14. And now connect up power and ground to the chip. Where power is pin 14 and ground is pin 7. Now let's make the oscillator circuit. We'll be using this inverter here. Where the input is pin 5 and the output is pin 6. Let's start by adding the capacitor. I'm using a 22 microfarad capacitor here, but really the value doesn't matter all that much. Anywhere between 10 and 100 microfarads will do. If you're using electrolytic capacitors, make sure you get the polarity right. It's usually marked on the capacitor. Now let's add the resistor. The human man is adding a one kilo ohm resistor, but the exact value doesn't really matter. Somewhere between 1 and 100 kilo ohms should be fine. To quickly recap what we've just done, 
we've connected the capacitor between pin 5 and ground and the resistor between pin 5 and pin 6. Now you'll notice that we have five unused inverters left. Now we'll probably find a use for them later on, but for now let's just tie all these to power or ground. It doesn't really matter which. Now let's add an LED so we can see what's going on, because that's always helpful. Make sure you get the polarity of the LED right. Here's a diagram to help you. It's important to add a current limiting resistor in series with the LED. This will prevent the LED from drawing high currents and being damaged, or from damaging the 74HC14. We're using a 1 kiloohm resistor. This will limit the maximum current to 5 milliamps. Now let's connect up our 5 volt power supply and see what happens. Ooh, it works! But it's flashing a bit quick. You can see it flashing on the camera, but in real life, me and the human man can't actually see that. It just looks like an LED that's on. So let's try changing the 1K resistor to a 68K resistor. Now let's switch it on and have a look. Well, watch it, human man. You just hit the camera. It's a lot better now. We can actually see what's going on. Using this slower clock, when we connect up other parts of the computer, we'll have a better chance of figuring out why it don't work. Let's figure out how the circuit we just made actually works. Bear in mind that neither me or the human man are electrical engineers. We're just physicists that own a few breadboards. Let's start by having a look over here. I'm going to go upside down because it's easier than trying to face the other way. When this circuit is first powered up, the capacitor is devoid of all charge. He's got no positivity in him at all. And while he's locked in his existential nightmare of nothingness, he's got no potential to do anything. Or in other words, V cap is zero volts. So the inverter has a logical zero on its input. The inverter is a strange individual. It wants you to experience the opposite of what you're experiencing. So, on the output, it gives a logical 1, or 5 volts, to try and boost the capacitor's potential. The capacitor, well, he's well happy with this. He's getting a boost of positivity. Gets him out of his existential nightmare for a bit. So, the capacitor, he's happy, charging away, getting more and more positive. But what's this? His positivity is leading to V-cap approaching the threshold for a logical one. Oh no! The inverter, being the creep that he is, decides that capacitor's just too positive. And then, well, he changes his output to a zero. Which starts to discharge the capacitor. And all of his positivity, well, it just leaves him. When the inverter thinks the capacitor has sunk too deep into his existential pit, or in other words, V cap becomes a logical zero, then he flips his output again. And now he can make the capacitor more positive until he decides he's too positive, and then he drains some of that positivity away. A very, very strange relationship the capacitor and inverter do have. The poor old resistor, well, he's just stuck in the middle. He tries to slow down how quickly charge is entering or leaving the capacitor. You know, he's trying to help the capacitor, but inevitably, He's just not strong enough. The inverter always gets his way in the end. 
the human man has drawn us a happy little graph to try and show this dysfunctional relationship. So at the start you can see the capacitor, he's happy, he's climbing, he's climbing. And then, well, the output of the inverter flips and now he's... He's discharging, he's, oh, he's, he's falling back into his pit of despair. Now the inverter's changed his mind, he wants a happy capacitor. So he's giving him positivity, he's climbing, he's soaring, he's soaring. Oh no, the inverter, he don't like it. He don't like it when the capacitor's happy. So he drains some of that positivity away, away and away and away. So in the end, Although the capacitor, resistor and inverter have somewhat of a dysfunctional relationship, it does benefit us because it gives us a nice square wave that we can use as a clock for our computer. Thanks, weirdos! So, let's get back on with that computer, shall we? Let's add the Zeddy to the Breddy! Yeah, that's right. We're using a Z80, not an Intel 8080. The reason is the Z80 is cheaper, easier to use, and basically everything written for the Intel 8080, well, it will run on a Z80. So why not make life easier for ourselves? When you first look at a 40 pin monster like this, it can seem a bit scary. But if you look closer, it's not as bad as it seems. So look, 16 of the pins form the address bus. This is what the CPU uses to address memory or I.O. locations. Eight pins form the data bus, which the Z80 uses to exchange data with the memory or I.O. devices. And then on this side, well, we have power and ground. We already know what those are. This clock signal is an input signal. Well, that's just the output from the oscillator we've just made. And then all we're left with are these control signals. Now, these output signals here, well, for the simple circuit we're making in this video, we're not gonna be using any of these or this output signal here. And the only input signal we're gonna use is going to be the reset signal. Let's start by adding power and ground. Now I find it easier to use a diagram which shows the physical location of the pins on the chip. Power is pin 11 and ground is pin 29. Now let's sort out all the signals we won't be using. The output signals, well they're easy, we just ignore them. The input signals though, we have to actually do something, but it's not a lot. We just tie them high. So these are the interrupt, non-maskable interrupt, wait and bus request lines. And these are pins 16, 17, 24 and 25. Now for the only control signal that we're going to use, the reset pin. This is pin 26. And we'll tie this high using a 1K resistor and then connect a jumper cable so that we can toggle this high and low. Floating pins in CMOS devices ain't good. So the resistor is there so the reset pin isn't left floating when we unplug the jumper cable during a reset. The next pin we're going to connect is the clock. This is pin 6. So we need to connect pin 6 of the 74HC14 to pin 6 of the Z80. By the end of this project we're going to have quite a lot of wires so it's helpful to try and colour code things. Now we need to make the display because it's always nice to see what's going on. To start with, the display will only contain 
the 16 address lines. We'll add the data bus some other time. So each LED has a 1K resistor because they're power mad maniacs and they might burn out the Z80. Now let's stick the display and CPU boards together. You'll notice here that the human man is having a hard time sticking these two together. Now we need to connect up all 16 address lines. The address lines A0 to A10 are on pins 30 to 40 and then address lines A11 to A15 are on pins 1 to 5. No one wants to watch the human man sticking wires in a breadboard so let's just skip to the end. Flipping Nora! He's made a right dog's dinner of that, hasn't he? We've come so far. We've nearly finished. Now we've just got to program it. What are we going to program it with? What about this? A no-op. It does absolutely nothing. Well, not quite nothing. It does increment the program counter, which we can see on the address bus. A no-op instruction is all zeros on the data bus. So let's hardwire continuous no-ops. The human man is using 1K resistors to tie the data bus to ground. Oh, come on, human man. Switch it on. Oh, well, it don't work. Boop. Hello, my name is Dr. Budgie. And over there is the human man. And we are dullards. Go on, human man. Point at the mistake. Yeah. So you know how the human man was having a hard time pushing these two boards together? It's because they're different boards. See, look, this one's got solid lines. And this one's got broken lines. So the power's just not getting to the LEDs. So go on, human man. Fix our primary school level mistake. And switch it back on and see what happens. Ooh, it's working. Not well, very exciting to watch though, is it? Human man, you should try changing that 68K resistor to a 220 ohm resistor. That'll make it go a bit faster. Go on, give it a go. Whoa, look at that. It's motoring along now. Don't you find it strange that in a video about making a knockoff out to 8.8 times 10 to the 3 computer, that... Well, it hasn't even featured, has it? We ain't even talked about it. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to wait until next time when we'll be having a look at the front panel and adding the examine next function to our computer. Until then, why don't you lot have a go on some of the online simulators Have a look at the schematics and see if you can come up with your own examine next function. And then you can compare it with what we come up with. Well, I mean, what you come up with probably going to be a lot better than the mess we come up with. Oh, actually, you'll probably end up just making us look bad, wouldn't you? Um, maybe don't do any of that. No, just sit there and wait for the next video. You do know the video ended five seconds ago. What are you still doing here? Sling your hook!